bum 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 bum. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Jingle Bells. Uh, Jingle All the Way review. No. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hello and welcome to Cookie Pocket Attempted a Podcast, episode 25. Yeah, 25. Wow. 25. 25th. That's too perfect. 25th. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. And Black uh, Christmas was 24 and it came out on Christmas Eve. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, we tend to do this a lot. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, Cookie Pocket. Uh, I'm here with Cristiano and Zaccaroni, and we are reviewing A Christmas Carol from 1999. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the 873rd thousandth adaptation of Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol. It's a made for TV film uh, directed by David Jones, starring Patrick Stewart, Richard E. Grant, Dominic West, Joel Gray, Desmond Barrett, and Tim Potter as a humanoid Tatooine native. So, <laughs> oh. in case you haven't had the pleasure of being aggressively mad, sad, and happy, A Christmas Carol is about a mean old geezer named Ebenezer Scrooge that, upon the death of his business partner, is visited on a Christmas Eve by his ghost, along with three Christmas spirits of Christmas's past, present, and future, to convince him to stop being a depressed fool and enjoy the magic of the holidays by going hysterical and wasting money. As, as Scrooge <laughs> says... Pick a man's pocket every 25th of December. So, <laughs> Christian and Zach, what did you think of the made-for-TV film? Uh, well, um, if, if I might jump in first, uh, I love the story of A Christmas Carol. It's my favorite Christmas story, uh, and I own basically every live-action version of the film. Uh, my father and I make it kind of a tradition to watch as many versions of it as we can every, every year around the holidays. Um, and this is a version I've seen several times at this point, and... I always want to like it a lot. Um, any version of A Christmas Carol, because I love the story so much, is going to have at least some favor with me. Because I just, I like those characters. I love the setting. I like the story in general. And this version, I always, for like the first act, think, maybe I was wrong. This is actually pretty good. And then somewhere in like the last third, it, it loses me. And by the end, I'm thinking like, oh, let's let's be over already. Like, and and, and it and I find that I'm not really enjoying myself by the end of it. Um, I think that uh, Patrick Stewart, though he's a great actor, I don't really like him in this all that much. I think he's variably either underdoing it or overdoing it, um, and it it just doesn't hit with me for some reason. It consistently hasn't hit with me like the past three or so times that I've watched it. So unfortunately, it's it's a two out of five for me. Well, that that is a shame, Zach. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, this is one of the rare times where I think I've enjoyed something uh, more than you, Zach. Um, I was looking Maybe. back on your past <laughs> reviews. I, I, I'm trying to build up my, my reputation to be less of a, a critic and more of an enjoyer of things. So I was, I was looking back at Zach's stuff, and I was like, I bet he's worse than me. And I don't think uh, you've given a one out of five to anything yet that we've reviewed. So I don't think so, no. Um, good for you. Anyway... Um, uh, with regard to this film, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I had no issue whatsoever with Patrick Stewart. I thought he was very good. I think he's pretty much always very good. And I, I, the only points in which I felt maybe you, you could say he was overdoing it is when he's he's back in his bed and he is a little hysterical <laughs> at first. <laughs> the, the weird yeah. laugh. The weird, like, yeah. yeah. Especially since he starts it out, like, he's choking and it's like, oh, do we need to do the Heimlich on Patrick? <laughs> like, that always catches me off guard as a weird moment. Yeah. It was, it was weird. It's definitely a bizarre moment. But at the same time, I don't think... I didn't have too much of a problem with it. Like, I, I think that's a conceivable reaction for someone to have who hasn't... Um, outwardly experienced joy for the past few decades of their life most likely Mm -hmm. so i i i didn't even have a problem with that um and uh (laughs) we seem to have a bit of a disagreement about the cgi and i'll agree it's not it's nowhere (laughs) near like ilm or or big big blockbuster standards or what have you but it didn't bother me i felt like it was relatively sparingly used and the one part that looks that looked really bad that made me kind of chuckle was at, in the final act when he falls into his own grave and then and I was like oh this is a cool moment he's like looking at his own corpse and then he's like falling through blackness and he's like oh and it looks like a bad powerpoint transition or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, 
Um, outside of that, and I, Zach didn't I, like the tornado. The snow tornado <laughs> looks very, very bad to me when when he and the Ghost of Christmas Present fly around in a in a snowstorm, and they look like a two D JPEG that's just being like <laughs> lifted around. <laughs> Well, I'm going to use the same defense that Zach always used whenever I come after the CGI in Doctor Who, which is it's under a TV budget, okay? So it's okay yes. if it doesn't look good sometimes. And um, I, I I know, Zach, you might be grading this off of um, this specific adaptation, especially since you've, you're you probably the most familiar with the tale and, and uh, the, the Dickens novel and what have you. But I, I do think part of my review is extending credit to the story itself, and I think that's appropriate. Um, I, I wouldn't feel right giving this less than a three because uh, unless it were to adapt the content truly poorly and do it, uh, misrepresent the book in some way, which I don't think it does, I think it, it's deserving of a three or better. So I was debating giving it a 3.5, but I ended up landing on a three and, uh, yeah, yeah I enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I wanted to mention, um, that the issues I take with this adaptation are not at all in terms of the script. Uh, in terms of how they adapt the novel, I think uh, I, I really like how they bring it to the screen. And uh, they even include some stuff that often gets left out of versions of A Christmas Carol that I was really happy to see. Uh, and I'm always happy to see it on screen whenever, whenever I do watch this version. Uh, I think the main issues with this are kind of budgetary and in terms of execution. Uh, and if they hadn't had that, you know, TNT Hallmark, because this is a Hallmark <laughs> movie back when Hallmark actually tried and didn't just yes. film uh. white people in a gazebo for 16 movies. Um, oh, <laughs> there are some good ones in there, okay? Hold off. Maybe, I've seen too many um, of them. <laughs> but if, I'm sure if they didn't have that Hallmark TNT schedule, they probably could have gotten this exact cast, exact script, maybe even exact budget uh, to, to look a little bit better and, and maybe be a little more entertaining on, on my behalf, perhaps. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I'm going to go out on a final countdown limb and say I gave yes. this a four, right? <laughs> and um, I've seen the one, the three that I have seen like often enough to understand them were the 1984 one and the 1951 one. Yes. And the, I think all three of them were different enough where I was actually able to like watch all three around the same time. And I know Zach watches too much film because uh, he has too much time to do so. Um, <laughs> but I that's like one of the few things I can definitely watch like all three in a row and not be fatigued. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I also enjoy this story a whole lot. Um, and it's definitely one of my favorite Christmas stories, uh, right up there with Rudolph. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, but I really like Patrick Stewart in almost everything that he does. Okay. I think he, he has a very, he has a certain gravitas with him and the way that he like shows his, like his Victorian side, his theater, you know, um, from when he was doing that, I think he definitely shows that a whole lot and how he exaggerates is so like compelling compared to like most actors I see. He's just so like, I don't know, he just has a way about him that's very unique to him. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like he he really pulls it off in um, Star Trek. And it's this is a lot similar to how the, how he like really pu- like pushes himself to react to things with a lot of emotion. Um, he uses that exactly the same here. And I think for the most part, it really works. Obviously, I, I agree with you two on both, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the bed scene was definitely, you know, they, they, <laughs> they could have done without that. Um, I think it was funny. I, I laugh at it every single time, but that's just me enjoying it. I think critically it doesn't really work. Um, but overall, I really like his, the way that he like presents the lines and stuff. I mean, someone who has not actually read the novel from beginning to end, mm-hmm. I think, you really can't tell what comes from the novel and what doesn't. And I think just the way that he presents that in this is really important um, for his role. And I just think he just meshes his own experience and then, you know, the the script really well, um, in my opinion. Um, as for, like, the side characters, I think a lot of the side characters are really, really memorable. And especially because each scene feels like its own mini almost its own mini movie like there's like a beginning and end to every single scene like there's always like a reason why they're there like why scrooge is seeing it or like you know why why the supporting characters are doing what they're doing there's always some type of score in the background obviously going on you know or you know the soundtrack um but i just every single scene is just so memorable and it's just i really don't feel that a whole lot with other with other iterations of this with other adaptations and i think 
Um, I think uh, part of it is is definitely, you know, Patrick Stewart, but also just the cinematography and like the scene transitions. Every single one is really unique, even though like seeing the CGI leaves blow away and then go through the walls and stuff obviously yeah. doesn't hold up, you know. But like we were saying about the TV adaptation and like you said, mm -hmm. the budgetary limitations are definitely, definitely there. Um, and then also the, the ghost of, of the future is, is yeah. very sad and definitely below average compared to most of, of what I've seen. Like I've seen other adaptations like further on, but like I said, those three are the only ones I've actually like seen frequently. And then mm -hmm. I, I, I've seen the Muppets one, but I'm not, Chris, I'm going <laughs> to save that for Christian. So Christian can talk about that later, okay. but, um, <laughs> thank you. But anyway, yes, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, besides that, though, I feel like it actually fits the pacing of the movie really well because things suddenly, st right when the Ghost of Christmas present shows the kids under his thing and everything. Um, yes. I always forget what they're called. Ignor ignorance, ignorance and want. Right? Want, yeah. ignorance and want, right. Okay. Um, ever Starting at that point, everything just goes exponentially fast. And at yeah. one, one way you could look at it to be like they're running out of time. And then another way I think you could look at it is it actually kind of fits the pacing of how they're building up because... At the Christmas present ghost was kind of taking things slowly because I think the ghost knew that he wasn't really going to be able to, you know, do anything. And he's kind yeah. of just like accepting of how everything was going. And then the Christmas present was like, listen, bro, we're going to take things real right now. We, I'm gonna, everything I say is going to roast your character. I'm even going to use your own quotes against you. And just stuff like that is like, I've, I know I've seen that like in the Alistair Sim version. I think they do that really well, too. Yes. But I mean, I, I don't know. It's just the way that. The way that Patrick Stewart, like, come, he has a very distinct, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, coming of age story here, I guess. And yeah, there's I an think arc there it's, that... Yeah, definitely, definitely, like, a really defined arc, and um, I just, and then, you know, once the Christmas present, like, he goes kind of being, like, happy and jolly, and then just being, like, this depressed skeleton, just, like, <laughs> telling him, you are so screwed, bro, everything you did is so messed up, and then, like... Then the, the basically the, the Christmas the the ghost of Christmas future or things to come is just like you kind of already know what's gonna happen and he's like he kind of just points him to directions lets him figure it out himself and I think gen, in in concept I think that works in execution it didn't really work too well in this adaptation but yeah. I just feel like the earlier parts of the film especially with the Christmas present ghost I think he just did it so it was just so well and it, and just really well acted and everything yeah. um, and then the the following scenes as he you know. He comes into himself and is jolly and stuff. I think ever how everybody's surprised and everything that just all that is just really cool too. So mm -hmm. I gave it a four out of five. I really think that the despite there being a lot of different you know things here and there, I just feel like I just feel like the the main concepts of the film and and like what Dickens was trying to portray, I, I, at least as far as I know in the novel, um, I think it's just I think it's just a really good adaptation overall. And I think you know everybody should at least watch this one to compare it to the uh, some of the better known ones. Oh, yeah. Um, so Zach, you said you didn't like Charles Xavier being a snobby humbug. So <laughs> yeah. for the both of you, how do you think Patrick Stewart handled the role? Was uh. he a good casting choice? Did he keep accurate to his words and actions of the book? <laughs> and did it help or hurt his performance? Um, and why? Well, I would say, uh, if you're going to play Scrooge, there's kind of two different ways that you can play him. Um, you can play him sort of how he's described in the book. If you read the, the, the book, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, Dickens goes really far with his descriptions of Scrooge, where he basically makes him seem like he's not even human. He's like this twisted old goblin of a man. Um, and I think a lot of actors play him like that. They, they use a very high voice and have a very <laughs> crooked finger. And he's almost like this male witch in, in some versions. I think uh, my personal favorite, the 1951 version with Alistair Sim, kind of takes that route. Or you can do what Patrick Stewart does here, where he plays him more as just kind of a, a human being. He plays him as a real man, uh, kind of an imposing man even, um, who has kind of been worn down over the years by all these disappointments. Uh, and I think kind of the two versions that play it that way are the 84 one and this one. And there's things I like of Patrick Stewart's decisions in this a lot. There's moments I like from him in this a, a lot. I like the beginning of this version where he's at Marley's funeral and he signs the death certificate and he sort of vows that uh, I'll make the firm succeed. I, I promise you, you might be dead, but I'm going to keep it going. Because that's definitely a moment of humanity and you see like 
these sort of miserly decisions, his sort of skinflint nature is almost, uh, it's almost based on this final promise he made to his partner. And I think it lends a lot of humanity to him. And there's also one little moment um, during the Christmas present segment where they're at uh, Scrooge's nephew Fred's uh, Christmas party and his friends are playing uh, Blind Man's Bluff and somebody says, oh, he's cheating. And Patrick Stewart from the corner of the room just goes, he is cheating. And it feels like <laughs> so real, so human. And it's, he doesn't have to like laugh boisterously or clap his hands or anything like other Scrooges would to indicate they're having fun. You can just kind of see in his face and in his tone that he's having fun in this in this moment and he's he's enjoying what he's seeing and thinking maybe I'd like this kind of thing after all. You you get so much from just that one little line and that one little facial expression. Uh, but a lot of the rest of the time, I know that this version kind of came about because Patrick Stewart did a series of Christmas Carol one-man shows on stage. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time I feel that he is maybe a little, a little big, a little over-theatrical in a way that would look better on stage. I might actually prefer to see this whole cast just put on stage for a theatrical version rather than television. Because I feel there's some things in this that would work a lot better on stage than they do here. Specifically, a lot of Patrick Stewart's performance. Okay. Yeah. So Christian, I, I, Michael Caine, huh? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Michael Caine. You Kane. know, that, I think that's fair to some extent, Zach. I mean, um, in the way you're describing sort of two distinct approaches to Scrooge... Um, and by the way, Mitchell, thank you for reserving the Muppets for me, because that's the only other version I'm well acquainted with. <laughs> I knew it. Oh, we got to change that next Even year. Even though I, 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 know the, I know the tale well, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I, I don't... It's strange, because I don't disagree with any part of what you said, Zach, but I disagree with the heart of what you just said. And I don't know how to address that exactly. Um, I... I I think it's normal for a character to overreact and underreact to different things. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the simplest way I can state it. And uh, uh, how else do I maneuver this? I don't, I think uh, it's worth noting the points at which Scrooge overreacts versus when he underreacts. Um, I think at least some of that is linked to who he's speaking or interacting with or who he's in the presence of. Like mm -hmm. um, when he's when he's on his bed, we talk about him overreacting to 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 an extreme maybe, and that's after he's gone through all these um, life altering uh, visions, and he's alone, and he's not worried about what other people see of him. And um, I do think he becomes more of a performer, especially after he returns, and we see him like play the trick on Bob, where he where Bob thinks he's going to get fired or punished or whatever, yeah. <laughs> and then he's yeah. like, I'm gonna raise your salary. <laughs> And uh, so I don't really, I thought he was great, honestly. I was very surprised when I read your review, Zach, because I, and I was worried because I was like, oh my gosh, maybe he is bad in this. Oh, that would be terrible. But I, I didn't then think Then I have to was. disagree with Mitchell and side with Zach again. No, no. <laughs> that would be the ultimate that tragedy. Been very bad. Very, very <laughs> bad. But I'm I'm glad that I'm not. And um, I do think he's rather similar to, to Michael Caine, by the way. They're, they both kind of take a human approach. Um in in each respective version and i had no issue with it i think um maybe the way he interacts with the spirits is a little uh, that's probably the only instance in which i think it's accurate to say he was underacting because yeah. i think mm -hmm. the spirits probably deserve a little more of a of a of a reaction in terms of surprise or, or fright in the first instance or what have you but in general i really yeah had little to no uh, issues with him and i thought he did well if i may um during the marley segment i i kind of thought back to our, our second ever episode when we were talking about the changeling uh mm -hmm. and you mentioned mm -hmm. that one one of your big complaints with that christian was that you thought that uh george c scott who also plays scrooge in another version <laughs> yes. um but you thought that george c scott didn't seem scared enough or wasn't frightened enough or impacted enough by the things he mm -hmm. saw in that film Mm -hmm. um, and I, that kind of came to mind when I was uh, watching the Marley scene because Patrick Stewart plays it less as frightened and more as, like, intrigued. Specifically, yeah. he says, he says like, but why do spirits walk the earth? And it's like he's hosting yeah. a documentary or something. Yeah. <laughs> and Mar Marley is meant to, like, terrify Scrooge. And I, I, I just don't get that from this version. 
I feel like I feel like they must have taken advice from Patrick Stewart on some of these scenes. I feel like they Probably. tried. They must have tried all of these. Like they tried to be as close to the book as possible. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they tried these scenes. And just thinking about how Patrick Stewart would play it out, I'd feel like seeing Patrick Stewart like maniacally scared of something just doesn't really work with his character. I'm not and sure I'm not gonna. Producer. I'm. I'm yeah. I will. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I will fault the. I will fault the. I will fault the film for that. But I feel like. I, j- I still feel like just just adhering to to Patrick Stewart's strengths and doing what would be best for him rather than what would be best for Charles Dickens and how he would want it to be I guess mm-hmm. you could say um, I feel like that worked a lot better with just the rest of the film in general I just feel like what the film wanted how how what what how the film wanted to portray its messages I feel like they meshed it around Patrick Stewart's performance a lot more than other adaptations did around Alistair Sim or, you know, Michael Caine or, or um, George or C. Stock, yeah. Or, yeah, George C. Scott, right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then George C. Scott also kind of has that issue a couple of times. I, I don't feel like he's really that frightened either. I feel like yeah. he's more frightened. I feel like he's more frightened, but I still, I just, he's he's Patton, okay? He's, he's like, <laughs> he's literally Patton. Like, he's yeah. not scared of anything. <laughs> so I, I, I think Scott's too detached as well. I think... He and Patrick Stewart and maybe Reginald Owen are kind of on the bottom rung of my Scrooges, but they've got strengths in different places. But I do agree that Scott is also too detached and not scared enough. And I do feel like there are, I feel like most scenes are always carried by one or two people every single time. I don't Mm -hmm. feel like there's ever like three or more people in one scene that are actually three or more characters, I should say, Hmm. Um, in one (laughs) scene that are, that are actually like, superbly showing themselves off right and i feel like i feel like patrick stewart has when he has those moments of not a lot of reaction it reserves that emotion for later or earlier scenes like i feel like if if the i think that future segment i think i would almost give this film a three if patrick if Sir patrick stewart had not shown himself as much as he did Mm -hmm. during the ghost of christmas uh, christmas future rather Mm -hmm. because i feel like that entire sequence was carried by him almost entirely yeah Yeah. and then i feel while i feel like the ghost of christmas past i mean maybe you could say it was a little just a little bit more towards christmas past but it was it was definitely a lot of stewart as well Mm -hmm. and then christmas present was entirely carried by christmas present like stewart had he had no flame back there was no way he could come back at him (laughs) Like, he, he completely roasted him. It was so bad. You know, I, I, he completely lost that debate, okay? Case yeah. closed. Leave the room. So I feel like that that variance is, I, I feel like that could be a criticism for being inconsistent, like, you know, as a character like Zach had kind of implied. But also, I feel like it, it, it just, it matches the film so well because a lot of the scenes are so different from each other and so independent, but are strung together by this one story that everybody knows yeah. that I feel like it works a lot for the film in general. Um, and I think that just comes down to subjective opinion, like literally everything. Yeah. You mentioned <laughs> Scrooge kind of going in and out uh, in this version, at least. I, that's consistent with the book. Um, reading the book recently and lining the book recently, because I'm preparing for a one-man adaptation of A Christmas Carol, shameless plug. Um, <laughs> cool. But, like, lining the Christmas ple- present uh, segment, I was like, where did Scrooge go? He, like, totally disappears in the middle of the, in the middle of the book. Like, you barely hear from him. You barely, like, they barely even describe, like, facial expressions. Chris, Chris, the Christmas present segment is entirely dominated by the ghost and the characters that Scrooge and the ghost see. Um, mm-hmm. And Scrooge himself kind of goes way into the background during that section of the story solidifying my four then because yes. that's how dickens wanted it <laughs> gosh go. darn it <laughs> um so my next question will be what were your favorite and least favorite scenes you don't have to be like you know totally into it just favorite least favorite oh okay i got this one um my favorite my favorite scene and also i think the saddest scene is when we get uh it's during the ghost of christmas past sequence where we get um, I guess you could say young adult Scrooge and mm-hmm. the woman he's going to marry and then she's like removing her vow and Patrick Stewart's like go after her to me that is the the best moment for for Stewart in general like that that hit me hard at least and mm-hmm. um, I think it's well acted between whoever it is playing younger Scrooge and and um, his I, at the time fiance I suppose um, yeah. I, I just thought that's well acted and it, I think consistently that's probably the the biggest moment where you see Scrooge sort of beginning his 
downfall into curmudgeon or or curm- whatever the the, <laughs> the noun form of <laughs> acting like a curmudgeon is. Um, I don't know if I have a least favorite scene. I didn't have issues with a lot, but if I had to pick on something, and I might get canceled for this, but if I had to pick <laughs> on something, I'm going to pick on Tiny Tim. I don't. Oh. I don't think this Tiny Tim is very good. And I was frustrated yeah. when when he opens his mouth and he starts singing. I was like, you know what? This kid's not a very good singer, and it is bothering me. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I I don't dislike Tiny Tim for that reason. I I do think most Tiny Tims don't quite hit the mark, and in this version, I don't think he hits the mark uh, due to his performance. I think it's fine for Tiny Tim to not necessarily be a great singer. Uh, in most versions, he's not a great singer. In, in even the I musical guess. version, he's not a good singer. <laughs> um, but I think it's more meant to be like, oh, you know, it's just uh, the family's together and the kid's going to sing a mm-hmm. song because it's sweet. Um, but yeah. if I'm going to go for like a, a most and least favorite scene, uh, I do really love, um, I think it's either when they're cutting up the turkey at the Cratchit house uh, in the Christmas the present sec- the, the goose. <laughs> oh my goodness, I've committed a huge Scrooge faux pas. You've got him! <laughs> um, I, I can't remember exactly which one it is. They're, they're either cutting up the goose during the Christmas present segment, or maybe they're bringing in the pudding. Um, but there's just these looks that Richard E. Grant and the actress that's playing Miss Cratchit exchange that I think are so great. Because you, you just see in those like little looks and smiles that these are two people who really, really love each other despite the poverty and despite all the setbacks and despite the trouble that Bob's having at work, like they really truly love each other and their family in this moment. And you get that entirely with just their eyes and their smiles. And I, I think that's great. Uh, another, another win for the acting in this version. Uh, if I had to go for a least favorite though, it's not necessarily a single scene, but I think the introduction of the ghost of Christmas yet to come in this version is kind of clumsy um i i can see like exactly what the scriptwriter probably had in mind when he wrote it down yeah and i can see a version of it that would be really imposing and creepy uh but christmas yet to come in this version just i i think the ghost looks so silly in particular they've made the decision <laughs> to give the ghost of christmas yet to come these two little beady eyes they're so obviously <laughs> led lights like they're so, they're, yes, he looks like a giant Jawa. They're so <laughs> obviously just these two Christmas lights at the back of his, like, hood. And every time they showed a close-up of the ghost, I was just like, oh, this just... It looks so cheap and dumb. <laughs> like, it... I'm in the Christian boat here of, of being the person to say something on screen looks stupid. Like, I, I, I think it's <laughs> such a tragedy. Because there's really great shots, or really well storyboarded shots of, like, Christmas yet to come looming over Scrooge. And the two little eyes take away all, like, fright and impose, and they, it takes away the whole imposing nature that the character has for me. Um, and there's also wide shots in that sequence where you can see that it's clearly just a guy with like a wire frame hood <laughs> extending <laughs> from his head as a hat. And yeah, I, th- I think the whole introduction of Christ- Christmas future is probably my, uh, my least favorite scene in this version. Christian's future. Christian's future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't see much there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I have a, I have a really tough time pinning down my favorite scenes. I really hate to not say one of my favorite scene- scenes has uh, Patrick Stewart in it. Just cause, cause I love him. I'm a stan. Um, but I, I gotta say, I am, I gotta agree with Zach. Okay. Hot take. I gotta agree with Zach. Oh I like the entire Cratchit household scene. Mm-hmm. I think all the kid actors besides tiny Tim. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is the best acting part I've ever had. That was just like, <laughs> it was, he, he was totally fine. Okay. He, he, basically every time they focused on him too much, I hated it. But anytime he just said like one or two lines, he's like, this kid is fine. Mm -hmm. Leave him alone. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise the rest of the Cratchits, especially Bob and his wife, that was like, like Zach said, that was like perfect acting. Like that entire yeah. scene, I would not change anything about it. Whether it was mm-hmm. like the turret, not oh, I almost said turkey because of Zach, because of the goose, <laughs> and because of the uh, well, what's it called? The 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 the, the plum pudding. The the, 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 the the plum pudding. But anyway, um, my least favorite scene, I would say, it's like anytime I see the tornado. But like, yeah. I also like that entire sequence, even though it reminds me a lot of the prequels. And. Um, Aww. 
and 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 uh yeah i i think i think him falling into the void um mm-hmm. and being transported into another dimension i think that was i think that was my least favorite scene because <laughs> oh, i'm always I, I i'm almost closing my eyes at that point what are you gonna yeah. say christian <laughs> Huh, I wanted to amend. Um, I didn't actually pinpoint a least favorite scene. I just whined about Tiny oh. Tim because I didn't oh. find him very engaging. Oh but no, I cut you I, off. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. Um, if I had to choose like a specific moment, I think it would be when, when all all these random Brits are haggling over Scrooge's old stuff because he's dead. Because it just sounded like <laughs> it just sounded like a bunch of people going, "Oh, it's Tuesday in it" for like ten minutes. Oh I no, I love that scene. Out. <laughs> I I do think. Um, I don't necessarily like the way that this version of the scene is filmed. I think there's other versions where you film it in like pure darkness and it's only lit with candlelight and it like almost oh, yeah. like makes it look like the denizens of hell like sifting through Scrooge's <laughs> like remaining belongings. But in this but it was version, just British people. It's filmed in a really small room. <laughs> there's sunlight streaming in through the window. Like I think it takes away a lot of the drama. But I do like that scene though. I don't like the drama, darn it. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Two pounds, five shillings, and eight pence. <laughs> you know the exact I laugh amount. every time. You every know time the exact that. amount. Wow. <laughs> yes. He's writing it in chalk on the wall. Okay, how could you forget? <laughs> <laughs> tongs, tick, tick, tick. Oh, no, great. Oh, I, I do like the sugar tongs moment. <laughs> old old Joe takes the sugar tongs out and he goes, pink. Like, within it's such yes. a great little actor moment. Where clearly yeah. whoever played it was like, I want to... I want to play with the sugar tongs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what were your favorite side characters? Like, you can name a few or one or none of them if you hate this film. Mm. <laughs> what, what are we classifying as a, as a side character? Like, somebody I'm guessing who doesn't have anyone a... but Scrooge, right? Bo- yeah, Bob Cratchit and Below, pretty much. Oh, okay. okay. Not saying that his wife is below him. That's, that's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, don't worry. The, the spin team's on it, Mitchell. <laughs> um, I, I do really like bob cratchit i like richard e grant as an actor a lot um and usually he plays like villains or insane people because he has kind of a scary bony face but in this version he plays such just like a loving caring dad and i really like his performance um but i do, i really like the ghost of christmas past in this version um because really the way that christmas past is described in the book is like impossible to execute on screen. It, it's described as the Christmas past wears like a crown of holly and all white, but at the same time is like amorphous blob that looks like a candle flame and has like legs and arms and faces sticking out from it at like all different Ew. angles at different times. It's something yeah. you can't possibly execute. But the, the point mm-hmm. is like it's this amorphous shape and you can't tell what it is. And I think they executed that pretty well for like a low budget. Um, because Christmas past in this is this sort of androgynous glowing shape where it's got this sort of long female hair and is like dressed in like frilly, almost female looking clothing. But at the same time, uh, it's a male actor playing the part. So it kind of fits in almost a theatrical way, this idea of an amorphous shape of a ghost that you can't quite tell what it is or, uh, what, what shape it might be in at any one time. I, I thought that was a creative way to adapt something that can't possibly be adapted yeah that's fair um i also similarly enjoyed uh, mr cratchit and um as zach pointed out i, I only i only knew uh, richard e grant from his role in one of my favorite movies star Ooh. wars episode nine the rise of skywalker <laughs> we, we <laughs> have to watch plays... whitnail and i sometime he's great in that mm. but yeah book it um and and uh <laughs> he plays a, a palpatine loyalist so obviously a villain and i've complained in past episodes how um frodo not being frodo was distracting but in this case i didn't find him distracting one bit i, I didn't think about his role in star wars at all i thought he was he was fine and i think that's a testament to his performance um if i had to choose a, a true side character this is also kind of uh, this is probably the third biggest lead part on aside from i don't know uh i enjoyed scrooge's nephew quite a bit oh, yeah. um mm-hmm. what's his i forget his name. fred uh, fred fred yes. yeah G- good old fred um yeah <laughs> I, I thought i thought he did a good job of being that uh there's i think there's a difficult balance to strike in terms of acting where you want to be this this character that's merry all the time but is 
is also well-meaning and uh, kind, but not in, not so cheery that he comes off as a plasticky idiot. And yeah. uh, I think that balance is struck well here. He feels very sincere, even though he gives Scrooge 10 more chances than Scrooge probably deserves. And uh, I just think generally that was really well played. Yeah. He's got a really likable face. I don't, I don't know the actor's name, but he's the kind of actor that smiles and you just want to smile with him. Right. Mm-hmm. The sideburns. His name's Dominic West. Okay. Mm-hmm. Dominic West, I like the look of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you Call out. Me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, mm, I mean, obviously, I like Bob Cratchit the best, but, like, I got to say Fred is probably my second favorite one. Probably. Yeah, I would say that. I think, I think Fred is... Yeah, I pretty much agree with what Christian said. He just put a fine point on it, and I really can't say anything about it. But, but I just I think he was always open to Scrooge in a natural way. It was definitely like just pushing the natural, like organic, just being an accepting family member type of thing. Being like, obviously he's just misled and he's not a terrible person type of thing. And he's like the most optimistic person in the room. Yeah. And he just plays that so well. And I, don't, I really can't think of any point where I felt like he was being down in that or anything. I just the way that everybody reacted when the Scrooge came back and everything just felt really natural. And obviously when they're dancing and everything that just that whole scene, I think really worked. And I think, I think Fred introducing himself was his best scene for sure earlier on. Um, and just Bob being like clapping after he did the, the speech yeah. and then everybody's like, Oh no, Bob, you messed up, bro. You're going to lose your job. <laughs> but you know, that whole thing, I just, I'm really along for the ride with that emotionally. And I think, I think Fred definitely was a perfect positive presence there. Um, so I pretty much know what you guys are going to say on this, I think, but which Christmas spirit was the most impactful? I'm not going to ask which one was the least impactful for okay. no specific reason. <laughs> hmm. huh. I, I'd probably say Christmas past. Um, I, I do like some of the stuff. This version, uh, adapts some stuff in the Christmas present segment that often gets left out. Um, for instance, the, the sprinkling of, uh, the milk of human kindness on like various interactions and scenes on Christmas day, uh, that's in the novel and most of the time gets cut out of adaptations. So I like to see that. Um, they also adapt the, the scene in this version, they use a a snow tornado, which is uh, not exactly great visual effect, but I do (laughs) like that they adapt the scene from the novel where Scrooge is taken all across the world and he sees uh you know dutch sailors singing christmas carols to each other on christmas day and miners singing christmas carols and lighthouse keepers and you see people all over uh britain uh celebrating christmas together and that that's a version that's a scene or a sequence that gets uh cut from a lot of different versions so i was glad to see it in this version uh but i do think christmas present himself here is sort of generic it's a ghost that kind of always gets adapted the same way uh, and I think Christmas past is sort of the most interesting and makes the most impact here compared to the others. I am surprised. Me too. Yeah. Now that I'm thinking about it, I didn't particularly love any of the spirits all that much, I guess. Huh. I don't know. I think in terms of performance, past was probably the strongest, even mm-hmm. though, um, and, and uh, acknowledging Zach's point about the visualization of that spirit being impossible to achieve, as it is in the text on screen, I still found uh, that visual distracting. He's like, hmm. he's got this very pale makeup and kind of like a weird outfit and he's human, but he's also a spirit. And it was, it was sort of a, an uncally, un, an uncanny, excuse me, place between being a spirit and being a human that just felt like closer to a bad imitation of david bowie than a ghost to me oh, <laughs> but, uh, oh no dang the, the, you the just performance made, was fine, <laughs> the performance was fine i think the actor himself was fine and generally most of the time i like the the ghost of christmas yet to come the most because i mm-hmm. i think that's the more the most uh, foreboding and the most interesting because that spirit has nothing to say to scrooge um audibly and uh, Zach's points about the, the ghost of Christmas present being kind of uh, similar in all adaptations feels true as well. So I don't know. I guess huh, I'm going to go with the Jawa as my favorite because at least that was uh, – <laughs> because I can't. That, that's my choice there. This is unprecedented. 
I know, this is, I'm so glad I asked this. Uh, yeah. So uh, the Ghost of Christmas Present is my favorite, okay? Mm-hmm. And I agree, okay? He has kind of like the same character in every single film. But like Zach had said, with the the Silent Night montage and, you know, this going around the world and stuff and him using his quotes against him, yeah. I feel like it was just like if you were just paying attention at all early, earlier on, it's just I feel like it's a lot more, it gives a lot more depth to, I, I think it gives a lot more depth to the ghost, but I also think it gives a lot more depth to Scrooge's character without Scrooge actually showing a whole lot of emotion mm-hmm. throughout the scene. And like I was saying before, I feel like the the that ghost definitely really, you know, I feel like he's definitely, he puts a really big impact. And I just think he has a lot of different things about him. He's not just like a baby Lumiere you know from like you know jim carrey's version or something like i understand like or like a jawa obviously Mm -hmm. but i just feel like he's he has like the easiest look to him but i also feel like he's he's definitely like the transferring from the ghost of christmas past to the ghost of things yet to come Mm -hmm. so i feel like him i think feel like he has the most important role in transforming scrooge and i also feel like he had some of the best scenes to handle and also some of the best lines in general whether that be to dickens or to you know hallmark so (laughs) (laughs) so um how did the mood atmosphere and setting mesh well with the story do you think it did particularly with the jar jar special effects what do you think um i I think it does in places um i think the opening of this uh where we see marley's funeral which we don't see in most versions and isn't really in the book uh, I like that a lot. It feels very cold. We see snow, um, which doesn't happen that often in this version, actually. Um, and I like to see that sort of cold English snow that looks like it's right on the edge of becoming rain. Um, I think that really works. All the stuff in the opening, I think, feels cold, feels bitter, really goes along with the establishing of Scrooge's character. Um, but I think later on, we get f- scenes that are filmed inside, scenes that are filmed outside, where I think the weather in the season, because it's likely they probably filmed this in like spring or summer because they're working on that TV schedule. And I think it starts to <laughs> sub- subtract from the film. Uh, we've got scenes that are meant to be like cold and bitter where there's just bright golden sunshine flying in through the windows. And I think it starts to kind of take away from what should be a sort of cold and wintry feeling scene. Uh, and instead it looks like it was filmed at like Colonial Williamsburg in the middle of the summer. <laughs> yeah i don't know i i didn't have an issue with it and it didn't add to the experience either so i guess i'd call it satisfactory it felt like a natural setting mm-hmm. um uh, for 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 scrooge's business and um uh, cratchit's home and what have you it felt generally similar to uh the muppet version i guess which <laughs> um yeah i i don't know i this is kind of a, a cop-out answer i guess but i i didn't I didn't feel heavily invested in the setting. I didn't feel like it harmed the film or helped it much at all, which I think is, is fine. You know, a setting doesn't always have to do that in my opinion. Yeah. I think the setting helps the most in like the beginning and the end and pretty much in the middle. It doesn't really matter a whole lot. I feel like a lot of the scenes are really defined by the music in general. And I just, it might just be me. Like I just really like the songs, (laughs) but I mean, there's always, you know, it's just the Rose. Okay. Like Fezzy Wigs party. Like that whole scene was defined by the song. All right. Mm -hmm. And you definitely feel like it definitely feels like Victorian England. And I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I really like the beginning, and I, I just like the the carriage and or the funeral. I don't know what what it's called. The the the, the funeral. Hearse. Okay. The yeah. fu- the hearse. <laughs> there we go. The hearse. Um, and like Zach had mentioned that that scene earlier. I also like that as an addition. Um, and just the sound effects, like the right when he's writing with the quill in the beginning. Oh, yeah. And I just feel like that the the whole setting is really established very quickly and efficiently to the point where I think it it works very well. Um, his house is big for no reason at all. Cause he's like, yeah. you know, I don't know who actually lives there or not. I didn't really, I think there's like a, a like a whole list of people that live there or something. I don't really know how that works historically, well, but anyway, he, it feels like he's in a big empty house basically uh-huh. is the feeling that you get on. What were you going to say, Zach? I, I wanted to mention that, um, something I liked in this version is in the book, those house, that big house belonged to Marley. Um, and he uh-huh. belonged, he owned this big house as like a status symbol, but didn't really fill it with anything. And Scrooge inherited the house and was like, well, I got a place to live and I I don't have anything to put in here. So I just live in a big empty house. And I yeah. like in this version that when he opens the closet to look for like an intruder, um, there's boxes in there that are labeled with Marley's name. 
So not only did he move in here, he didn't even move Marley's stuff out. <laughs> like, he has so little property that he didn't even bother to move the old boxes out. I did really like that. Like his heart. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, and then towards the end, I feel like the brightness worked, okay? The way that, that because we have Picard here having, like, a panic attack in the middle of bed, we might as well have the whole scene completely illuminated. Um, mm-hmm, yeah. Everything. It's so bright! And everything like that. <laughs> um, and just walking and just saying hi to people on Christmas Day, being bright and everything, even though it would be like half of the uh, sky would be smog and stuff. But anyway, <laughs> like it was in the beginning. Yeah. But I, I, those are the two points where I really, really remember the atmosphere. And I think just the general mood worked really well. And obviously like the blue light and the really, you know, dark sequences with the ghosts of the Christmas yet to come. I really hate that. Okay, ghost of future okay whatever Christmas yeah future. Um, <laughs> agreed <laughs> everything is dark like it should be um you know everything's kind of generic and dull looking when they're going to the different people um besides the light beaming in it's still relatively dark you know but i mean i think it worked pretty well i, I would say if anything it, it helps but i don't definitely don't think it subtracts um yeah so i guess i don't know what i was gonna ask what your favorite adaptations were i guess zach has seen like a gazillion of them like how would you rank this one um i'll ask christian first do you think Uh this is comparable to the muppets one or do you think it's just a different version it's pretty similar bizarrely enough because in in the muppets one the only major difference is is gonzo is charles dickens and is narrating the whole thing (laughs) along with rizzo which is a really funny (laughs) tag Uh (laughs) and um i mean i would just uh, putting me on the spot here i would probably put the muppet version higher just because i really like the muppet version all right i'm not, no, I'm no. not talking to you all right zach what do you think <laughs> oh my goodness. i'm just kidding i'm just kidding i'm just kidding okay no, the yeah, muppet it, version is pretty good okay yeah it, it's no it's no it's dog fun. on this one it's just uh i just really enjoy the muppet version but um those are the only two i'm familiar enough with to rank anyway so okay. yeah um I, I do like the muppet version uh the muppet version is a fa- uh, favorite in in my household um and i think it's probably the best version to introduce kids to um, because it has, you know, your favorite puppets guiding you through the plot as, as narrators, <laughs> um, which I think is really helpful for younger viewers. It's the first version I ever watched. Um, but if I compare it to all the other live action versions, um, if I compare this version rather, I, I do think this falls a lower on the totem pole for me. I think in terms <sighs> of, in terms of script and tone, this has a lot in common with my favorite version, which is the 1951 version with Alistair Sim. Um, but I think in execution, it, it fails in most of the places that the 1951 version succeeds. Uh, and it probably, this version probably falls down close to the bottom with uh, the, the George C. Scott adaptation and Scrooged with Bill Murray and um, <laughs> the 1938 version with Reginald Owen. Kind of down with some of my not lesser adaptations, but versions that I don't enjoy personally as much. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's fair. I would say my least favorite one ever is the Disney version from 2009. Just because it's disturbing. Oh, with Jim Carrey? Yeah. Hmm. And Gary Oldman. and uh, Yeah. I don't want to talk about that one. I, but I've seen that one. I've seen that. Scrooged. Yeah, I, I've seen I've seen Scrooge mm-hmm. a couple times, and it's fine. I, I like Bill Murray and other things, so if I want to see Bill Murray, I'll watch other things with Bill Murray in it. Yes. <laughs> and if I want to see Christmas Carol, I'll watch yeah. this or the George C. Scott version or the uh, Alistair Sim version. I don't know. I just feel like the, the quality, I really think that they're defined by their time periods for sure because the 80s version has a lot of very you know oh. common 80s tropes in it. it. They almost hurt the film in a lot of ways. Definitely. As yeah. does the Alistair Sim version, but I mean... You know, I feel like there's a, a lot of really solid scenes in that one. I'm not really sure. I'd have to watch them again. That's just my cop out answer and all every time mm-hmm. I say this. But I, I legitimately haven't seen either the the Scott one or the Alistair Sim one in a year, so I can't really compare them too much. I would say this is yeah. for sure my favorite one. I feel like it. I, I won't say it like it's gonna last with time. I feel like it might get hurt by time a little bit just because of the effects and mm-hmm. the certain mannerisms that people wouldn't really understand. Um, but I feel like in terms of one that doesn't age at all, I would feel like Alistair Sim is definitely like objectively yeah. probably the best one. Like I, I, I feel like, I just feel like he captures what, what Dickens probably would have wanted judging based off of what I've read from Dickens and all I will ever probably read of Dickens. Um, but yeah, I, yeah. I think this one, I think trying all three and then trying the Muppets one and then liking the Muppets one the best is your best course of action. <laughs> so, so you, so you can cop out like Christian. Yeah. But anyway, oh. uh, <laughs> I endorse this message. <laughs> yes. 
But yeah, Alistair Sim has a really, just a very notable performance, and he just, it really feels like he wants to be Scrooge. It doesn't feel like he's acting like Alistair Sim. Like, yeah. You know, it doesn't feel like Patton is trying to be somebody or Charles Xavier, you know, it feels like, it feels like he's really trying to capture what the book was trying to capture, and I think that ultimately is what's going to put him over the edge. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts before we get to the, the epic segment? I like um, Patrick Stewart from Professor Xavier <laughs> to the guy in Uber Eats aside Mark Hamill to Ebenezer Scrooge, and that is that. I also agree with that statement. Thank uh, you. I might not love this film, but I think you should check it out. It's it's a pretty good adaptation of Yay. a Christmas Carol, uh, regardless of some of its uh, of some of its uh, failures in execution. Okay. Okay. Fair. Fair. Yeah, I think you should try this. I think um, if you like Patrick Stewart and you like The Christmas Carol, that's all you really need to like this at least enough to give it a three. But if, you know, I don't know, if you hate Patrick Stewart for some reason and want to give it a two, <laughs> then that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you should try it. You should definitely try it. It's, I think it's a good good one. Or just read the book, you know, if you have time. But anyway, <sighs> The Rundown. <sighs> Yes. I, I forgot which Christmas song I was going to do this time. There, I remembered now. All right. right oh, do no I even says. need to do an overview of this segment anymore? I don't think I do. Mitchell, oh. are you ready? Uh, no, wait. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, I should have done no, the I'm overview. Ready. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Okay, we, we say things and Zach says numbers too. Okay, ready? Three, <laughs> two, one. Oh. TV film adaptation. Three out of five. Patrick Stewart is Ebenezer Scrooge. Two out of five. Browser light mode of Christmas past. <laughs> three out of five. Fezziwick's party. Three out of five. Being haunted by three spirits. Four out of five. Zach Garrigus, founder of the feast. <laughs> four out of five. <laughs> A coffin nail being the deadest piece of iron mandry in the trade. Uh, four out of five. Anakin ruining it with Padme. Three, three out of five? <laughs> the ghost of Christmas constantly roasting Scrooge like a chestnut. Uh, three out of five. British people. Uh, three out of five. The Cratchits. Four out of five. Scene transition. Three out of five. The Silent Eight montage. Three out of five. Ninety special effects. Uh, two out of five. Mr. Topper playing blind man's buff and being dreadfully shy. Uh, three out of five. Funeral lunches and black gloves. Four out of five. Selling things to expert buyers. Four out of five. Uh, four three aspect ratio. One second. Oh, three Time. out of five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right. Boy. Um. Yeah. A Christmas Carol. You know, nineteen ninety nine. What a year, right? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. This has been fun. This has been yes. fun. Okay. Yeah. Holiday special. This premiering is... on Disney Plus for fifty dollars. <laughs> this is our last holiday special of the season, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but yes. we will be back. Uh, we, we plan to be back this summer with a whole new season of uh, discussions on film for mm -hmm. our dedicated listeners, all three of you. Um, yes. So stay tuned. <laughs> Keep watching. Especially our, our Irish listeners. Yes. Hi, Irish Mom. represent. <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> well, it's been fun, boys. Uh, been fun. Merry Christmas. 